focus on another one of the general epistles, uh, the book of James, which contains an awful lot of um, material that is very basic uh, to the Christian life. The matter that uh, James addresses uh, ties in with uh, what is addressed in the other parts of the general epistles, uh, James, Peter, John, and Jude. And it focuses in in a very specific way on day-to-day Christian living, on what it is we need to be doing and how we need to be going about uh, our Christian life. And uh, some very uh, practical and very specific things. Because Christianity, from a biblical standpoint, is not simply a list of beliefs. Uh, It has to do with an approach in terms of our daily life, our relationship with God, our relationship with neighbor, our relationship with the world around. Now, James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, We find a reference back in in the book of Acts in various places uh, to uh, uh, James, and uh, uh, he is referred to in the book of Acts as the Lord's brother. And he is uh, the one who was uh, the uh, uh, a younger brother of Jesus Christ, evidently the oldest of the children of Joseph and Mary. And uh, we we find uh, the fact that uh, uh, he began within a short time after the resurrection uh, to have played a very prominent part uh, in the uh, the. Uh, history of the church in Jerusalem. So we find uh, James presiding over the uh, the conference uh, in Acts chapter 15. We find uh, later on w- when uh, uh, you know when Paul uh, uh, came back uh, there that uh, to uh, Jerusalem for the conference uh, we find that uh, uh, James was the one who was presiding over uh, the conference, and uh, when uh, it uh, uh, you find that in Acts chapter 15, you find it on down uh, in uh, verse 13, where James answered and and uh, then pronounced in verse 19 uh, his sentence, the official. Uh, the official uh, decision of the Jerusalem conference. Uh, As you come on through uh, in the book of Acts, when Paul returns to Jerusalem in the the latter part, we find in in Acts 21 and verse uh, verse 17, Acts 21, 17, when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. The day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he particularly declared what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. When they heard it, they glorified, uh, they glorified the Lord and said, You see, uh, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are that believe, and they're all zealous of the law. So we find uh, clearly evidence right here that uh, uh, it says that Paul came in to James and all the elders were there. So obviously James was the one uh, who was the uh, presiding elder, the presiding apostle uh, of the uh, church in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, Paul came in there and uh, came to James. And uh, all the other elders were gathered together and they uh, had this discussion. And it's very plain from Acts chapter 21 that James uh, mentioned to him, uh, referring to the Jews in Jerusalem, who believe that they are all zealous of the law. Now, there is no indication that there was some great problem between Paul and James. You know, the world has the idea that Paul did away with the law. And uh, very clear, James says, look, and all these Jews that are zealous of the law, and Paul didn't say, oh, isn't that terrible? We need to go and, and uh, uh, you know, explain to them that they shouldn't be keeping the law, that the law is done away. Why didn't Paul explain that? Well, James was the very brother of Jesus Christ. You would think that if Christ nailed the law to the cross, uh, that James would have been one to know about it. Uh, Because, uh, in fact, uh, uh, just uh, hold your... uh, the uh, 
the thing that uh, uh, that is uh, that is plain when uh, uh, when Christ after the uh, after his resurrection uh, we're told very clearly that he appeared uh, that he appeared unto James uh, he appeared uh, you, you know in various uh, um, he appeared to various ones in first Corinthians chapter 15 first uh, Corinthians 15 and verse 3. Paul says, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, that he was seen of Cephas, which is Peter, and you find that back in Luke 24, 34, uh, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Uh, now, so Paul makes it very plain in, in 1 Corinthians fifteen seven that Christ appeared in a very personal way to James. So Christ appeared to James after the resurrection. Now, if, if according to the idea that a lot of Protestants teach, that the law was nailed to the cross, don't you think that would have been a good opportunity for Christ to have informed James that this law is nailed to the cross? Uh, you know, here was his own brother, uh, who the evidence is was not one who really believed him and followed him in his lifetime, but uh, evidently James was converted at the, in, in the context of the resurrection uh, because... Uh, you know, the, the earlier events during his ministry, don't you remember how that on more than one occasion uh, his brothers uh, wanted him to come back home? You know, they showed up and said, look, uh, tell him uh, he needs to come on back home. And uh, there, was not, uh, there was not an acceptance that his, uh, that his uh, brothers immediately had. But when he was crucified and then was raised from the dead, there was no question. You know, that... You can just imagine how hard it was for them to realize that they had grown up with God in the flesh. Even though they may have, uh, you know, respected Him and loved Him immensely, uh, the idea that He was God in the flesh must have been a very difficult thing for his own brothers who had grown up. You know, maybe he was, what, three years older than James or, or, or just, you know, a few years older. They had grown up, had played together, and no matter how close they were, and no matter how much James might have looked up to him and, and have respected him and how much uh, Jesus stood out as different than the other boys when they were, uh, you know, when they were little, the concept that this was God would have been a very hard thing uh, to have accepted by someone who was so close to the situation. And yet, in the aftermath of the crucifixion and the resurrection, when he appeared to James, that there must have been, at that point, uh, the realization on the part of James that uh, Jesus really was who he said he was. And so when James introduces the book of James in chapter 1, in verse 1, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To whom... Uh, so, James clearly recognized uh, and, and uh, acknowledged who Jesus Christ was, that he was the Lord. Uh, and he introduces himself as a servant uh, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so the uh, uh, so we find this uh, this sort of thing uh, that that is there. So here here we find this contrast with what is popularly taught that 
in the book of Acts, it's very clear that James was one who believed in the law. He told Paul, he says, we have many people here, uh, uh, many Jews here who are converted, who are zealous of the law. And then he told Paul in Acts chapter 21, Verse 21, they are informed of you that you teach all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they should, they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. And so, uh, coming on down in verse 24, notice the latter part of the verse, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So, James recognized that Paul kept the law and that there were rumors going around about Paul and Paul even to the point that the uh, the customs, you know, not only did they keep... Uh, uh, you know, keep the, the law in the sense that uh, right on down to uh, all of these customs and things that, that pertained here to the Jewish community. Now, they had made it plain that the Gentiles did not have to perform the ceremonial rituals, that a Gentile did not have to be circumcised in order to be uh, to be uh, baptized. And that the decision had already been made, but that didn't affect the fact that the Jews continued to circumcise their children as a, as a physical sign of the, of the covenant with Abraham. But it was a matter that it was not a matter of salvation, that uh, it was not something that was necessary to gain access to God. But James was one who certainly did not believe and did not teach that the law was done away. And here he was, uh, the very brother of Jesus Christ. So, if Christ had done away with the law, if the law had been nailed to the cross, then it seems like James would have uh, figured that out somewhere along the line, and uh, that Christ would have told him, uh, after the resurrection. But uh, here we find in the book of James that James is uh, uh, writing here, and he's writing to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, James evidently didn't recognize that uh, all the twelve tribes were now Jews. Uh, he understood there to still be twelve tribes of Israel, and that they were scattered abroad. And I think we went through a little bit last time in, in First Peter, uh, how that Peter wrote to the diaspora, to the uh, to those who were dispersed uh, in, uh, in that way, and where because the the apostles, the twelve, had been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, uh, there in Matthew ten, uh, they did not primarily go to the Gentiles, but to the house of Israel. And James is here addressing the twelve tribes, and. Uh, We'll see that some of James's epistle uh, was read even in areas. James was was carried with great esteem among a wide variety of people, and even those who were not uh, converted and not a part of the church. Uh, James, uh, the Jewish historian Josephus of the first century, mentions James, refers to him as James the Just. Uh, he was uh, held in very high uh, esteem and respect by all of the uh, uh, of the Jews and uh, uh, certainly was recognized even uh, among many of the tribes scattered abroad i think we have to realize that the loss of identity of that israel's identity became gradually lost to the world at large but that is not to say that uh, many of them did not retain uh, a knowledge uh, of who they were uh, for quite a long time in fact there are secular historical records uh, that show that uh, primarily at this point in time uh, the house of Israel was located was clustered in three main clusters one was in Britain the other was in that area south of the Black Sea uh, up in, in uh, northern Asia Minor just on the southern coast of the Black Sea uh, those are the areas that Peter enumerates in First Peter areas that Paul by the way was not allowed to go to uh, I know. I think you had covered in detail the journeys of Paul uh, for you. Uh, I am not going to go into all of that, but I will call your attention to something that may not have been called to your attention at that point. Uh, let's go back 
um, here to uh, Acts 16. The um, Notice Acts 16.6. 6. When they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word to Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit allowed them not. And so they passed by and came to Troas, and then the vision to go over to Macedonia. Now here specifically, they were forbidden to go into the province of Asia and into Bithynia. Well, if you, uh, Paul was, if you notice what uh, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The places Paul was not allowed to go by God's Spirit were the places that Peter addressed. There were two Galatia, there was northern Galatia and southern Galatia. Southern Galatia is the part where Paul preached and it was, it was Greek. Uh, northern Galatia is the area from whence the Gauls migrated on up into France at a little later time in history. In fact, the word Gaul and Galatia are, are derived from the same, they're, they're simply different forms of the same word. Uh, and, uh, uh, that's where the, the name, uh, uh, that's where the name comes from. They migrated from there, uh, in uh, a little bit later than that. But what we find is that Paul, who was the primarily the apostle to the Gentiles, was not going into the areas that had been settled by the twelve tribes, but rather we find the twelve were, and we find that James addressed the twelve tribes scattered abroad, which were primarily uh, centered in Britain, uh, which, of course, was a part of the Roman Empire at that time. You know, and there, It was part of regular Roman... Uh, trade routes, uh, there, the tin mines in Cornwall uh, supplied tin for, for uh, use in the Roman Empire. And there's uh, very clear evidence that uh, a number of the early apostles uh, spent some time in Britain. Uh, there are uh, British historical records that Joseph of Arimathea uh, actually was buried in Britain. Uh, and uh, some very interesting uh, uh, things that, uh, uh, that uh, get into that, which uh, was... He was probably a relative. Uh, some uh, some historical records uh, indicate that he may have been uh, an uncle or a cousin uh, of uh, uh, one of Christ's parents. Joseph of Arimathea was evidently related to Mary and uh, uh, had a, uh, a family relationship. And, and also historical records indicate that uh, he uh, was involved in the tin trade with the... Uh, with the uh, tin mines in Cornwall uh, that uh, uh, were uh, were involved, so it's very likely that there were even some family connections there. James was uh, uh, anyway. You had primarily the House of Israel located in Britain. You had them located in, along the southern shore of the Black Sea, and you had them located in Parthia, uh, which was to the east uh, of the Roman Empire. And this was the section that, that stretched on up uh, into. Uh, what was anciently called Scythia, which was uh, sort of this uh, uh, these plains there of uh, what uh, later came to be called Soviet Central Asia. It was from there that many of those people, the word Scot derives from Scythia, uh, and it's from that area that many of the uh, uh, many peoples, the, the many of the tribes of Israel migrated up into Scandinavia and into some of the rest of uh, northwestern Europe uh, from that area of Parthia up through Scythia and, and in northwestern Europe that way. So those three areas in Britain, uh, southern shore of the Black Sea and Parthia, uh, were where the 12 tribes were primarily scattered. And uh, James, th there was a lot of knowledge of that that was preserved. Uh, Josephus even makes uh, passing reference to some of that. Uh, uh, there was a lot of knowledge that has been lost as time goes now. So anyway, James uh, addresses here, and he uh, initially focuses in on the subject of developing character. He focuses in on the subject of developing character. There is a reason why we're here. He says, count it all joy when you fall into different trials and tests. Now, that's not our normal reaction. And it's not a normal human reaction. Why would there be anything joyful? 
because there is a result that is produced. The trying of our faith works patience. It produces tested character. You see, let patience, let this this uh, tested character uh, have her perfect, her complete, her finished work that you may be brought to completion. You may be mature. You may be fully developed. You may be where you need to be, entire, wanting nothing. Now, if you lack wisdom, you can ask of God and he will give it to you, but you have to ask in faith, uh, not wavering. Uh, a double-minded man, verse 8, is unstable in all his ways. The uh, So he says in verse 12, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, that endures these trials and tests. For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. When we're tempted, we're not tempted of God, because God can't be tempted with evil and doesn't tempt anyone. We're tempted when we're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. When the lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death. So there's a progression. It starts with our mind, it proceeds to our action, and it results in consequences. There are attitudes and thoughts in our mind that produce actions. You see, ultimately, the battle has to be fought and won in the mind. Where people generally start is try, is with the consequences. They try to figure a way to get out of the consequences or to make the consequences smoother or better. Well, that's the wrong end to start on. You know, they're trying to do a patchwork job on consequences. And they may even get back a little ways to trying to control the actions. But ultimately, the actions are the result of attitudes. See, lust, when it is conceived, brings forth sin. There is an action that is produced, and, and the analogy is drawn just like a, a child is conceived and it develops and it's finally born, finally brought forth. That's the way it is. That's a first the temptation, a thought appears, and it's held, and it's thought about, and it's uh, allowed to sit and to fester and to grow, and sooner or later then it produces an action which in turn leads to a consequence. So we're tempted when we're drawn away of our own lust, when we're enticed by our own desires. Every good gift and every perfect gift, everything that's really complete and perfect and finished, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Absolute consistency is what comes from God. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So we have been begotten of God as a result of his will, his choice. You know, we can't convert others and we're not converted because somehow we earned it or we deserved it that it was not on our initiative, it was on God's. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You see, God has called us as the first fruits. He's going to deal with all the rest of mankind, but right now God is calling out a first fruits. So he says... Look, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Because the wrath of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. When we take things into our own hands, we don't produce godly results. So he goes on and tells us to uh, put aside the, uh, the filthiness, the naughtiness, and to receive with meekness the engrafted word. That we are to put aside the things that are naturally produced by us, and it's as though uh, here the comparison is is uh, something that is grafted on, just like uh, grafting a tree. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You see, James focuses in on the fact that we have to act on what we know to be. Simply a hearer 
and he addresses this again about uh, uh, being a forgetful hearer, um, that uh, that is that's no good. Simply to hear, simply to listen, if it doesn't produce results, if it doesn't produce action in our life, God's Word is intended to change and transform us. So, James discusses here aspects of the development of character. That there are tests that are involved, and that those tests are for a purpose of producing uh, something in us, producing an enduring uh, quality, uh, a, uh, a matter of, of tested character, that when we're going through tests, we need to ask for wisdom to understand uh, what it is we're, we need to learn, that he focuses in on the fact that uh, uh, our temptations don't come because of something God is doing to us. They originate in us with our attitudes and our lusts and desires and that uh, we uh, uh, need to recognize the progression that produces sin and death and then he focuses in on our calling as the first fruits. And just a number of, of basic uh, principles here in terms of, of the way that we need to respond. Now, he, he talks about being a hearer and not, just a, uh, and not just a hearer, but a doer. And he says in verse 23, if you're a hearer and not a doer, it's like someone looking in the mirror, seeing his face. He beholds himself, goes his way, and immediately forgets what manner of man he wants. Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, notice what how James defined the law, or described the law. He referred to it as the perfect law of liberty. So the law was not described as some great yoke of burden. It was not some harsh uh, thing that uh, God had to do away with. But it is the law of liberty. And uh, he says if you know somebody looks in the mirror and they see the big dirty smudge on their face or their hair is messed up or something, and then they just go their way and they don't do anything about what they've seen, it obviously hasn't done them any good to look in the mirror. And he says if we look into the perfect law of liberty and we don't act on what we see, we don't continue therein, we're just a forgetful hearer. It doesn't do any good if it just goes in one ear and out the other. God's word is intended to be acted upon. James is one who explains a great deal about the fact that real faith, real faith produces actions. There are actions that that come forth, and it's not uh, uh, just a, uh, you know, just a sort of a good feeling. uh, He says in verse 26, If anybody seems to be religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, uh, he's deceiving himself. His religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So it involves two things. It involves, one, actions in terms of, of helping and serving others, particularly singling out here those who are least able to return the favor and to do for themselves or or to provide for themselves and right along with that to keep himself unspotted from the world. We live in a world and James makes it plain in several other places that we can't compromise with this world and with its paganism. We're to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. We're not to be tainted and corrupted by the the influence, the attitude, the customs, the approach of this world. Because they will pull us in a particular direction. Now, when we're told to visit the fatherless and the widows, uh, you know, other scriptures tie in with that. Uh, Paul says in the book of Galatians, in 
chapter 6 and verse 9, he said, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So there are a couple of things Paul makes plain. He says, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all men, especially to them that are of the household of faith. So, Paul makes plain that first and foremost, uh, our service is to others who are a part of the household of faith. They're, they're part of the church. But we certainly should be willing to be helpful and kind uh, to anyone, everyone, as the opportunity presents itself. That doesn't mean that, that the whole thrust of our activity ought to be out to, uh, you know, trying to save the world by building hospitals and orphanages and, and that this is the work. He says, as you have the opportunity, he's talking about individuals. When you have the opportunity to do good, do it. Especially to them that are of the household of faith. You you, you can't do everything for everyone. You know, we could take uh, we could take everything that we had and spend it on feeding hungry people in India, and we wouldn't even be able to feed them all for one day, and then we'd be hungry too. You know, it's the problems of this world are beyond human solution. That's why the kingdom of God has to be set up. If man could solve it, uh, then why does God why does God need to set up his kingdom? He just needs to give man a few more years to get the bugs worked out and uh, we'll have it all taken care of and Christ can uh, just stay in heaven. Because we, you know, we get, uh, uh, you know, good administration in there and and they get it all taken care of. Well, no. Pure religion and undefined. You know, the re- real religion reflects itself in helping and serving, being willing to inconvenience ourselves, being willing to serve one another, particularly the widow and the fatherless, those who are unable to return the favor. And it also involves in keeping yourself unspotted from the world. Uh, if you become tainted and polluted with this world's uh, ideas. You know, the way to serve the fatherless is not to put on a Christmas party at an orphanage. Uh, that, that's not the, uh, uh, you know, that's not going to uh, say, well, you know, we're visiting the fatherless. Well, you may be, but you're not keeping yourself unspotted from the world. You know, 365 days out of the year, and, and uh, uh, so uh, there are a lot of things that... Uh, uh, can be done. So, James brings out an approach here. Continuing on down uh, now in chapter 2, uh, he says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. You know, a human tendency is to categorize people on the basis of physical things. We are impressed with what looks impressive. Someone comes in and they're all uh, decked out and they... Uh, uh, they have, uh, they're obviously wealthy and successful. Someone else comes in and, and uh, is uh, obviously very poor. What is our natural human tendency? Uh, you, you know, we are, uh, humanly, we can be attracted to somebody, oh, you know, we're ready to defer to this fellow that looks uh, very impressive, very wealthy. Well, there was a lesson that's recorded for us back in 1 Samuel. You remember the story. God so told Samuel, I want you to go to Bethlehem, to the family of Jesse, and anoint a king to rule over Israel. Saul has disqualified himself. And Samuel went. And he told Jesse to bring his sons in before him. And when the oldest son came in, Samuel was very impressed. And as soon as he saw him, he knew this was the man that was destined to be the king. Obviously, he looked like a king. Big, strong, handsome man, just the way he carried himself, the way he presented himself. He looked like Samuel's idea of a king. And Samuel was very impressed, and he just knew this was the one. And God said, no. 
So Samuel asked to see the second son. And this one looked pretty impressive. Well, they went through seven sons, and every time Samuel saw one, he thought, well, this one looks pretty good. And it went through all of them, and God said no. And finally, Samuel said, do you have any other sons? <clears throat> he said, well, yeah, I got one. You know, he's sort of the run of the litter. He's out with a sheep. I didn't figure there was any need to call him in. Samuel says, well, I think you better. And then God told Samuel, he said, look, man looks on the outward appearance, but the eternal looks on the heart. Samuel, you were impressed with these other men, but you were impressed for the wrong reasons. They looked like a king. But David has the heart of a king. And that's what I meant. You see, you read that David was a man after God's own heart. There was a quality of courage, of conviction, of wholehearted devotion that David had that none of the others had. The tendency that all of us have is the same tendency Samuel had, the same tendency human beings have, and that is to make our mind up on the basis of what we see. And we see the outward appearance. And we see someone that looks wealthy and successful, and immediately we're drawn to that individual. We see someone uh, who uh, is destitute, and uh, yet God looks on the heart. You see? God looks on the heart. He says, uh, you know, if you make some great distinction on the basis of, of those things, uh, in terms of the way you treat people, if you treat people differently based on outward appearance, you are become, verse 4, partial. You're judges of evil thoughts. Verse 5, Has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to them that love him? You know, who has God called primarily? The poor of this world, rich in faith. You know, so many of those who are rich with this world's goods uh, have been very poor in faith. And uh, God has not called primarily the, the, the great, the wealthy, the powerful. So, James makes this contrast here in the fact that we are, if we have respect of persons, verse 9, um, we are convicted of the law we commit sin and are convicted of the law as transgressors. Now, there are a couple of things you learn here. One is that to commit sin is equated with being convicted of the law as a transgressor. You see, sin is the transgression of the law. And if you commit a sin, then you are convicted of the law. Now, the royal law, according to the Scriptures, verse 8, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's very much a part of the law. In fact, that's a quote from Leviticus 19.18. That's a part of the law. He refers to it as the royal law. Now, Jesus quoted this in the New Testament. You remember the occasion? He was asked, what is the great commandment of the law? He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Now, James quotes the second part of the law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do, do you think that, uh, uh, you know, Christ said that that was the second most important. Uh, so, if James stresses how important this is, you can imagine how much how important it is to love God with all your heart. Christ said that was the greatest command, but the second was was like and was based on it, and really the two go hand in hand together. Because if you really do love God with all your heart, you're going to love human beings made in the image of God, realizing that they uh, you're going to love whom God loves. 
And God loved humanity. God made man in his image with the potential of being born into his family at the resurrection. So, James quotes this and says, If you have respect of persons, you commit sin. You're convicted of the law as a transgressor. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. He that said, Don't commit adultery, said also, Don't kill. If you commit no adultery, yet if you kill, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak you, and so do you, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now, which law is James talking about here? Well, obviously the Ten Commandments. It's a law that has points. He even mentions two of them. He said, if you break one point, you have broken the whole law. It's one law. And that we are to be conscious that we will be judged by the law of liberty because that's really what it is it is the law of liberty it is the way of God that points the way to real freedom now as we go through the book of James it becomes very apparent that James did not believe the law was done away and I think it becomes all the more apparent why in the original inspired order that God uh, inspired for the New Testament that the general epistles came right after the book of Acts and fired Paul's epistles. You know, if you read James and Peter and John and Jude before you read Paul, you would have a mindset that would enable you to understand some of the deeper, more philosophical concepts that Paul explained. Because if you understand that the Scripture does not contradict itself, then James makes it very plain that real faith, real living faith, involves obedience to the law. And that the law is not downplayed at all. And that's really not in Paul. But Paul said some things that are a little hard to be understood. Peter tells us that. There were people who took what Paul said out of context and they misapplied it. There were problems even back when we read in Acts 21. James told Paul, he said, you know, there are rumors that are going around about you. There are things you're accused of and I know you that they don't represent what you believe and teach. And we've got to do something to make it obvious to everyone that you really are not guilty of that which you're accused. Well, coming on down, we're told we'll be judged by the law of liberty. And uh, God's law is there as, the, as the, uh, the standard by which we will be judged. We'll have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy. Coming on down in verse 14, what does it profit? Will a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? You know, if you see someone that's destitute and you say... Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, and you don't help them, then what profit is there? Uh, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. A man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe there's one God, you do well. The demons believe and tremble. Faith without works is dead. Works are the life and the breath of faith. Faith without works is dead. Now, the kind of works that it's talking about are works that involve acting on our faith. Acting on what we believe. If we really believe it, we will act upon it. To say, oh yes, I believe. I believe this or I believe that. If we don't act on it, we obviously don't believe it very deeply. You know, Noah, the example is given in Hebrews 11. Noah, being warned of God, moved with fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his house. <laughs> Noah acted on God's warning. He believed God. Now, what were his works? His works were acting upon what God said. You see, if, if, um, 
if we believe God's message, then we'll act upon that message. And uh, uh, our faith is evidenced by our works. So when there are those who say, well, you know, all you got to do is just believe. Believe. Just believe. Well, if they're not works that accompany that, then you really didn't believe very much. You know, I mean, a lot of us have been exposed to, to uh, you know, Protestant revivals and Billy Graham and, and some of this sort of thing. And all you got to do is just believe in Jesus. You believe that there's one God, you do well. The devil believes in that. You know, if, if it's a dead faith, if it's not accompanied by action, it doesn't do any good. A dead faith won't save anyone. Faith without works is dead. Abraham was justified by works when he offered Isaac his son. You stir it was going to make in the community. I'd better not go back. Uh, and uh, it, it was a matter that there was faith and works. And in some cases, uh, because I believed, I was scared not to do what God said. Uh, you know, we were told by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Well, you, you know, a lot of times it's inconvenient to depart from something that you've been doing. Uh, it's going to create a stir, and if you, if you could figure a way to keep on doing it uh, without making a stir, well, you, you may be tempted to do that. But when you read what God said, if you really believe it, then you simply have to do something. Faith and works go hand in hand together. Abraham believed God, and he acted on that belief. So, chapter 3 goes on, and it says, uh, Be not many masters. This is used in the, uh, the old sense of, of master being teacher, uh, you know, like a, uh, the uh, schoolmaster uh, or uh, uh, the... Uh, Principal at many of the uh, schools in England was called the headmaster. Uh, he was someone who uh, had mastered the subject and was in a position to teach it to others. And so that's the way the, the term is used here. Be not many masters. Don't uh, be quick to, to want to teach, knowing that we, you know, Paul or James lumps himself in as one of the, the teachers, shall receive the greater judgment. We're going to be judged more strictly. You know, in many things we all offend. And if anybody doesn't offend with what he says, he's a perfect man. You can avoid ever saying the wrong thing. Then you pretty well, you know, there's nothing else you can't take care of because that's the hardest thing to control is the wrong thing slipping out. And he describes here how we, uh, you know, a little uh, bit controls a big horse, a little... A little helm controls a big ship, and a little tongue uh, controls an awful lot. Uh, He talks about, draws various analogies about the tongue and how it seems to be untamable, uh, full of deadly poison, verse 8. Therewith we bless God and we curse man, which is made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So, then he comes on down in verse 13. Who's a wise man, endued with knowledge? Let him show out of a good conduct his works with meekness of wisdom. So, he describes here uh, our tongue and what we say, and then he begins to get down to what's on the inside. Again, we get back to uh, the issue of character. That it's not just a matter, it's not just a matter of controlling what we say, that we must come to grips with what we are, with what we think and feel on the inside. You see, you're never going to really get rid of the things that come out of the mouth, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if we're going to really change what comes out of the mouth, we have to change the heart. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, verse 14, glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above. It's earthly, sensual, and devilish. So bitter envying and strife in our hearts is going to result in a lot of poison coming out of our mouth. That has to be rooted out. The envy and the strife. 
Because where there's envy and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. So it is, the, it is a contrast of attitudes that originate below with Satan the devil and attitudes that originate above with God. And it produces different actions in our lives. The attitude gives rise to the action. And the action produces consequences. In chapter 4, he says, Whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your own members that war, of your own lust that war in your members? You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, cannot obtain, you fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. Verse 4, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You can't fit in with this world and fit in with God at the same time. You know, it's, it's in, there is a total incompatibility between this world's value system and God's value system. And, uh, uh, you know, the strife and the, and the trouble that, that has comes because people want what they don't have and they're ready to take it away from somebody else. Paul, or James makes, makes plain here that to be part of this world is to commit spiritual adultery. That we must be faithful to God. We must be unspotted from the world. To start compromising with worldly customs and pagan uh, symbols and pagan attitudes uh, is spiritual adultery. You know, when you go back and you look at some of the, that's why uh, God made plain over and over that some of these uh, some of these things, whether it has to do with a, a full idol or only a picture or a cross or uh, various other uh, religious symbols, uh, the steeple, various things, where did these things come from? Well, they're pagan symbols. You can go back and read about them uh, in the Old Testament even. They, they were things that God told Israel to get rid of. They were not uh, they, they, they did not originate with the people of God. They were not things that originated with, uh, with Israel. Uh, they, were not thing, they were things that originated in Babylon and in Egypt, among the Canaanites. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. You can't fit in with this world and fit in with God at the same time. We have to make choice of our allegiance, of our loyalty. Now, he said... You know, the, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy. We're pulled in a direction of really wanting to fit in and craving that way. But God gives more grace. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How do we derive more of the spiritual gifts that come from God? He gives seven points right here. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw an eye to God, and he'll draw an eye to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn, and humble yourselves in the, light, in the sight of the Lord. Now, let's look at each other. You know, it starts in the mind. The first two things have to do with an attitude of mind. If we want to receive more of the spiritual gifts that God gives, how do you do that? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to surrender to God. You've got to submit to Him. An attitude of mind of being yielded to God and resistant to the devil. So it has to do with an approach of our mind that we want God's way more than anything else and we want to resist Satan then once you have made a decision to submit to God, to resist the devil, the next thing you need to do, third point, is to draw near to God. And he'll draw near to you. How do you draw near to God? Through prayer, through Bible study. How do you draw near to someone that you're close to? You know, How do you draw near to your, to your husband or to your wife? Back when you were courting. Back even, you know, when you were just interested. You started spending time. You drew near. You spent time together. 
we draw near to God by spending time with God in prayer and in Bible study. And if we're if we're spending time with God, then God is spending time with us. See, after the first steps are in our mind, making a decision to submit and to resist, then we start focusing in on what we do in prayer and Bible study to draw near to God. Then there are actions that are produced in our lives to cleanse your hands, you sinners. We look and there are things we start doing and stop doing. We make changes in our actions. You know, that's really the easiest things to do. You stop working on Saturday. You start tithing. You, uh, you know, throw the Christmas tree out. You quit eating pork. You quit smoking. You, you make physical changes. You cleanse your hands. You quit doing things you used to do. But that's not all there is to it. You've got to purify your hearts. You double mind. You see, there has to be a process of moving away from being double-minded. Being double-minded is being pulled two different directions. And that's, uh, you know, when we first start learning the truth, we're still pulled two different directions. Part of us wants to fit in with the world, and part of us wants to fit in with God. We've got to, there has to be a process of purifying our hearts, of changing the way we think on the inside. And that leads, you see, into the sixth, a key which is to be afflicted and mourn. Really deeply repent. Really deeply repent before God. And verse 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. One of the prime ways we humble ourselves is with fasting. So there's a process here that makes us receptive to God working in us. Verse 11 tells us, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. If you're speaking evil of your brother, you're judging. And, uh, uh, you know, you get so busy busy judging uh, that you don't have time to be doing. You know, that sometimes can happen. People are quick to notice what everybody else ought to be doing, that uh, uh, they're so busy judging the law that they don't have time to do the law. Sometimes I've preached sermons and, and, uh, you, you know, how many times... Have any of us sat there thinking that we hoped so-and-so was really listening? Sometimes I've even preached a sermon, and, and, and it's been funny. You know, you could look down and see a husband or a wife sort of jug the other one and say, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And, uh, uh, that's human nature. Well, you know, what we have to do is we have to listen for ourselves. We sp- if we're speaking evil of our brother and we're judging our brother, speaking evil of the law and judging the law, we, we don't have time to do. We're so busy judging. There's one lawgiver who's able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? So, you know, we need to concentrate on the doing and leave the judging to God. Uh, then he addresses uh, the approach that we're to have of recognizing how limited we are. You know, people say, well, you know, tomorrow or today, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do this and I'm going to stay here in this city a year and I'm going to buy and sell. I'm going to uh, do all this maneuvering. And James says, look, what do you mean? You don't even know what's going to be tomorrow. What is your life? It's a vapor. It's here and it's gone. Why? You don't, A year from now, you don't even know if you're going to be here a day from now. What you ought to say is, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. You know, don't get to thinking that you're the one that makes all the plans. Uh, realize that everything we plan is subject to God, uh, what God works out. Um, <coughs> this rejoicing is vain. Uh, to him that knows to do good, verse 17 To him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So here's another uh, another criteria, another aspect of sin. That we're accountable for what we know and what we understand. So he says, now in chapter 5, he says, Go to now, you rich men, 
you, you know, you're going to have consequences come on you. He talks about uh, those whose riches are corrupted, uh, how their gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them will be witness against them, will eat your flesh as it were fire, because you've heaped up treasures together for the last days. Now that's sort of an interesting thing, and I think it ties in prophetically to Revelation 6 and Isaiah 2. You know, one of the things that happens in the, this is specifically talking about uh, treasure heaped up for the last days. People who are deriving their sense of security from gold, silver. But one of the interesting things about radioactivity and the way that it works is that uh, gold, uh, when, in, when gold is exposed to radioactivity, gold absorbs the radioactivity and becomes very highly radioactive. And it will burn your flesh. It becomes too hot to hold. And when you read in Revelation 19 about the nuclear attack and some of these things that are going to happen, you read in Isaiah 2 and uh, Revelation 6 about people throwing their gold uh, to the moles and the bats and the caves, uh, it says, you've heaped this treasure up for the last days. Well, it's going to eat your flesh as if it were fire. It's going to be contaminated. Uh, sort of an apt consequence that's going to come. Here are people who have acquired wealth by taking advantage of others. Uh, you know, the higher the laborers who have reaped the fields that's been kept back by fraud, God has heard. People who have cheated and, and, and maneuvered and manipulated. Verse 5, you've lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. You've nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and killed the just and he doesn't resist. So he says, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Well, the farmer has to wait for the earth to bring forth the crop. And, you, and he has long patience. Finally, he gets the early and the latter rain. Be you also patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draws near. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. The judge stands before the door. So... He addresses the way that we need to approach things and the way that we need to live. He talks about enduring, again, ending up on the note of character. In verse 11, we count them happy that endure. You've heard of the patience of Job uh, and have seen the end of the Lord. Now, this term end, uh, same word is used earlier by in Paul's epistles to refer to the, quote, end of the law. Well, here it talks about the end of the Lord. Does that mean that the Lord has ceased to exist? No. The, the term that's translated end in, in these places in the New Testament comes from the Greek word telos, T-E-L-O-S, and it has an interesting meaning. It has to do with, with, a, with the result to which action is directed. It specifically has to do, uh, the, the very meaning of the word involves purpose. That it is a, it is a, the consequence to, to which action is directed. That there is, is purpose, there is something that is being directed uh, to produce a particular result. The law is, has direction to produce a particular result. Christ's life, uh, was directed to produce a particular result. And uh, uh, we see the example of Job. We see the life that Jesus Christ lived. Uh, you know, here is the result of the trials and the testing that we go through. So he then says, And above all things, my brethren, don't swear, neither by heaven or by earth nor by any oath, that your yea be yea and your nay nay. Now why does he make such a big deal of that? He's saying that as Christians, our word ought to mean something. That what we say is what we mean. It doesn't take all sorts of oaths to somehow mean that we're telling the truth this time. Then he ends up with several miscellaneous injunctions. If we're afflicted, we ought to pray. If we're merry, we can sing psalms. If we're sick, call for the elders and let them pray. 
The anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, they'll be forgiven. We are to confess our faults, our weaknesses one to another, and to pray for one another that you may be healed. And that healing here in verse uh, 16 can certainly encompass the whole gamut, not merely a physical healing, but, but emotional and spiritual healing. An attitude of being able to pray for one another, to be able to, to face the weaknesses that are in our way. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a human being, just like we are, and he prayed, and a great miracle occurred. It didn't rain for three and a half years, and then it rained when he prayed. So, here we find an, an example that, that Elijah set, and he was a human being. Prayer can accomplish things. Prayer can change things. So James emphasizes that right here at the end. Then he says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. And will hide a multitude of sins. When you're able to help someone, somebody is getting off the track, somebody is, is getting confused, and you're able to help them, uh, you have done something that is, uh, is very constructive and very beneficial. Uh, so, you know, it's not that we can convert in the sense of opening a person's mind, but we can be uh, influential. We can affect and influence other people and sometimes can help somebody, uh, and that's very, uh, that's important. So, as we look here in an overview of the book of James, I think we have a very practical guide to Christian living, a very practical approach that focuses in on the necessity to build and to develop Godly, righteous character. It focuses in on the importance of God's law and the way to rightly apply and use God's law in our lives. Uh, it focuses in on uh, these things in, in terms of our approach uh, to living faith. Faith that reflects itself uh, in obedience to God. And uh, the book of James reflects uh, a very important overview, a very practical approach uh, toward our relationship with God and our relationship with one another uh, and becomes uh, foundational to uh, really growth and understanding and practicing of our Christian life. So with that, we'll be uh, concluded this evening.